Hey everybody, I'm Dane Sanders. I want to welcome you to Fast Track Coaching. Uh, this is, I think, we're in the high 160s episode right now. Uh, we've been doing this for over three years. And if you're unfamiliar with the show, it's basically a conversation with me and uh, some folks I have high esteem for. And we're having virtual coffee. This is coffee, not beer. It's early in the morning. Um, uh, hanging out and talking a little bit about creativity and business and how you might be able to move both forward just a little bit this week. Uh, the purpose is not to change the whole world, uh, but hopefully uh, it will inspire, give you a little bit of uh, gumption, moxie to go do something new that you haven't done in a while. And today's guest is someone uh, I'm really excited to have on. John Keatley, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, John, I, I found your work uh, kind of rolling around the internet and found some amazing um, depictions that were pretty unexpected. Uh, and I think the first image I saw of yours was uh, Tim uh, Gunn, the, the amazing uh, uh, make it work guy from all the reality TV shows. And when I first saw it, I was a it was surreal to me because I thought there's no way that's real. Like there's no way that you got him to do that kind of work. And that led to a whole bunch of other images that I saw. And if you're at home and you're watching, you might want to go straight away to KeatleyPhoto.com, K-E-A-T-L-E-Y, photo.com. And as we're talking and, and we reference different works, you'll see right on this main site what these are. And I think it'll be beneficial for you. But without wasting any time, I want to jump right in. How the heck do you get to get those people to do, to do those kinds of images? And we'll talk about a bunch of them, but I want to start there. Um, well, I think um, I think it, it it depends again on the on the image and what it is that you're trying to get someone to do. Um, you know, you're not always going to get everybody to do every idea that you have. I I've had several shoots where we had these grand ideas and it didn't end up working out exactly how I had expected. Uh -huh. But I think always just being ready for anything because you're dealing with people, you know, and people are people. They're um, unexpected things will happen and um, no matter how much you communicate about something uh, so that being said especially if we're talking about editorial work it's a lot more unpredictable than uh, advertising which is going to be a lot more scripted and planned out and everyone's usually on board but um, I think really being excited about an idea and trying to convey that excitement and uh, being able to convince the people that you're working with of your intentions or your ideas and mm. being able to clearly communicate those and um, kind of bring them along is something that's um, that's important especially if you want to try to start working in you know kind of quirky or unexpected or unusual uh, type portraits like I often do awesome well you know it's funny I'm getting ahead of myself because honestly I'm just excited to be on the call with you I and I get you know you're a very humble guy you're very understated and even in our pre-call in advance of this, I was just struck by your accessibility. Uh, but in that, I, I, I probably need to back up just for a second um, because I do, I do have a number of things I want to cover today. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with John, um, share a little bit about your journey uh, into photography. Because uh, as I was doing my homework on you, it, was, it, was, um, it seemed like you were largely self-taught and uh, an enthusiast who just made good on a on a vision in your head. Uh, talk a little bit about your journey. Yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much it. I I was in college when I first well I picked up a camera. I took a high school photography class, like I think most people did, but uh -huh. I didn't really think much of it. I, I remember enjoying it. It was a fun. I enjoyed the creative aspect of it, but it was a class that you had to take. So. I you know I wasn't totally in it. Um, in college, I picked up my grandpa's old film camera mm -hmm. simply because I didn't have any pictures of my friends in my life and I just wanted to have an account of my college years and so mm. I took I, I didn't take that many rolls or shoot that many rolls of film um, but I think the last role that I took to, to get developed um, I, and it was the last role because my parents had a talk with me and said I couldn't be spending any more money on film because I had to pay for college and so the last role I took in to get developed, um, the lab manager came out and spoke with me and she, she said, she looked through my pictures with me and asked if I'd ever considered being a photographer before and I, I honestly had no idea what that even meant. In the small town where I grew up there was a photographer and I think he was also the reporter and the editor I mean, of the newspaper and yep. uh, it just never like crossed my mind that that would be something you could make a living at, um, let alone, I mean, anyway, it was just a foreign concept to me. and so. 
but despite that, I, I decided right then and there that that's what I was going to do. So I went home and I broadcast to my family that I was going to be a photographer. And um, my daughter says hi in the background. <laughs> um, so that was that was kind of it. I was still in school and I I continued on with classes, but I pretty much poured all of my spare time into into photography. There weren't really a lot of resources online back then. Um, when, when would this have been? Like circa when? This was uh, 2001, I believe. Okay. Um, and so you, I and you were in Seattle at this this whole time. Yeah, I was in Seattle. Uh, I was I was at SPU. Okay. And uh, I there was a this is a couple people on the whole campus who I think even owned you know cameras, and so I just connected with anyone that had any sort of connection or ideas about photography, and um, I ended up getting a job shooting for my university and. Mm. Um, some people there introduced me to a couple of photographers that they hired who were um, one was local, one was out of l a um, and one of the one of the staff photographers for the Seattle Times who's since passed away he uh, his name was jimmy lott he um, he mentored me for a couple of years and um, really gave me some great advice and he was someone who uh, he didn't sugarcoat anything he was brutal for lack of a better term um but it was good because I think it like really refined me, and you know, it he he didn't give me any illusions about what I needed to do, and so um, I just kind of dove in, and that was that. But yeah, largely self-taught, even even up until this point. So, well, there's a lot in what you're saying that's really striking to me. Uh, one is that you had a mentor who was a journalist, and in my limited experience, uh, journalists can be one of the have some of the harder edges um, in our industry. Uh, it's and sometimes cynically so, um, mm -hmm. but but not not universally. But that's often the case. And and I I'm with you. Like I appreciate the uh, they carry the weight of the world sometimes on their shoulders of what they're about. Uh, but yet I, in our conversations, you don't strike me as having that kind of. Um, you didn't get bit by the the cynical bug. You, you seem like you you you, know, you you don't seem very grumpy. Uh, but what am I? What, what what do you think about that? We're, we're just new friends, so. Uh yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think I, I th it's interesting. I think that um, it's easy in this industry to be cynical or upset. I mean, you're basically pouring yourself into what you do, and you care more than anyone else does about your work. And That's right. It's definitely the kind of job where there's victories and there's defeats. Sometimes I think the defeats can be more frequent than the victories. But um, you know, if if you you can shoot something. I mean, I've had it's. I've had it all happen. I mean, you'll shoot something you're like thrilled about, and then mm -hmm. the photo editor says, "You know, didn't you shoot more? Is this all you shot?" And, <laughs> and it, it could be like you know one of your favorite images, and they just they wanted to see more, or you know, you could do a really great job, and everyone's thrilled, and you'll never hear from anyone you know mm -hmm. about it. They'll just be like, "Okay, good, we got this picture." And so it it can come across as a thankless job in in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, That's fair. And and again, I don't say that to. I'm, to be like to be bitter. I mean, I think even you know even people who you think oh they didn't thank me. I mean, it's not that they don't appreciate you. It's it's such a it's such a um, just stressful cutthroat kind of industry that they're busy and you know like photo editors sometimes when they finish the job like they're on to the next one already. Sure. So you you have to you can't take things personally. I've learned. Um, which was tough in the beginning because I'm an emotional person, which I think probably a lot of creative people are, and so you take it personally. Um, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to um, to find that balance. But I think also for me, I'm very persistent, and I think um, sometimes in the past I've maybe taken that what I perceive to be negativity or frustration, and it's just fueled me even more. So. If if I sense that someone's saying you can't do something or you didn't do something right or whatever, it just kind of pushes me even more. And, and again, that's not even necessarily where those that feedback comes from sometimes, but mm. that's sometimes where I channel it. And so mm. I think um, ultimately you have to get to a point where you are creating something that you're proud of and that you care about and that you love and that you know, mm. you know what it means to you. And then it's easier to not worry so much about what you know other people say or don't say but well, it goes on and on i mean it's the kind of thing where you know especially in down economy i know some people like that's right they might have three four weeks between jobs and it's easy to start thinking like oh nobody likes my work or i'm not doing very good or whatever but um again that's not the case it's just when you're in your head that much and you have limited information to work with it can, it can be difficult but mm -hmm. it, anyway to answer your question 
I mean, I love what I do, as I'm sure most people would say in this position. And, um, yeah, I feel really fortunate. And um, I guess it's the kind of thing where I have the mentality that you can't just wait around for what you want to happen. You just have to make it happen. And so I feel like in the last few years, I've been able to kind of identify what that is and go after it. And so even when, you know, work might be slow, I'm constantly working or busy with at least projects that I want to be doing that are fulfilling. So mm -hmm. I think that definitely helps to avoid some of that, you know, jadedness. That well, th there's a number of things in what you're saying that I'm hearing at least. Uh, one is that you're looking for, you know, a resourceful approach to an industry that doesn't give a lot of handouts. You, uh, you have to work really hard to to put yourself in a pot, in a constructive position. And it sounds like on some level, um, both for yourself and, and it sounds even prescriptive a little bit, like if folks are listening in, gosh, it might be resourceful to not spend a whole lot of energy around um, making up stuff in your head about what those you're trying to serve are doing or thinking or not doing. Uh, there's only so much you can do and, and what can you control and take action with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the same goes with any job. I mean, that's right. People, people who are persistent and motivated and, um, you know, kind of goal oriented. I mean, those are the people that are going to get after it and make things happen. And so there's really no room for feeling sorry for yourself or getting frustrated. And, and I, again, like I, the people I work with will tell you, I mean, I get frustrated. There's days where, you know, I just can't believe what just happened. But hmm. I think it's fine to vent and discuss that, but then you have to be done and move on. You can't hold on to that. So That's it's fun. healthy to be upset or, you know, get frustrated. Those are definitely real and, and healthy feelings. But you just, yeah, I think the difference is you can't hold on to them. And, and sometimes you'll run across people who have held on to those things. For a and, long time. You know, it's it doesn't do you any good. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, not just uh, the the uh, the cool big time paying gigs. I'm actually curious a little bit about this the space in between your great jobs. And before we're done today, I definitely I will because I know folks at home are going to want. We're going to talk a little bit about some of your more iconic images. But um, in between these great shoots, it seems like you have a consistent habit of doing a number of things. Number one, it seems like uh, you have a lot of personal projects that are running all the time. Um, and it seems like those personal projects set the table for um, other opportunities that might work commercially. But earlier in our conversation, you made the distinction between um, editorial work and advertising work, where advertising is usually there's a lot more voices in in the process. Uh, a lot of things are decided in advance of the shoot. Really, you're just executing on the day as opposed to doing a ton of creativity on the day. As a, I guess the creativity would be in advance of the shoot. Um, is when you're in that editorial work or personal work, or you're wanting to take a risk with the you know the Tim Guns of the world, um, uh, or even some of the other stuff you've done in Liberia and these other personal projects. How important is that? Are those in between projects in advance of uh, the big the big ones? Um, I mean, I think I, I think well, I think personal work is extremely important. Um, I think that it's important to to be creating and to keep your mind in that place where you're creating whether it's for someone else or for yourself um, I think sometimes when I do a personal project it's more just for that self-satisfaction and desire that I have to create something mm -hmm. sometimes there's more of a agenda to it or a goal you know like this project is going to help me present better in, in this area or that area but um, I found even the even the times where I don't have a, a goal or a specific uh, plan for a personal project so many times when I get a job the the presentation that the client gives me is like the majority of the work that they're showing me they're responding to is personal work um, even if I sometimes I feel like wow how did you get from there to there it sometimes doesn't even seem to connect but hmm. I think um, can you give an example of a specific job or well just well it's funny I, I had a I had a conversation once with um, a friend of mine named Jeremy Cowart, you probably know Jeremy and his work, and he he talked very in, in a very common language around what you're describing, where he would find himself in a in a conversation with like E Entertainment or something, and uh, he he thought he blew the interview or the conversation, and the last minute he sh he throws some some job he did it in a an NGO effort, and they go crazy about wow you got that image with limited resources you'd work great with Paris Hilton and they you know made this big jump uh, yeah, to, right. to you know that kind of thing is, is that what you're describing where, where people make a kind of leap 
or and I just want to make sure I get my mind around what you're describing. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of it. I mean, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes people make a leap in the wrong direction. I mean, there's been <laughs> times where I didn't get a job because I wasn't quirky enough or something. You know, interesting. Um, and you think like, wow. I thought I was kind of quirky, but so sometimes people overanalyze things in one way. But then, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, I, um, I just actually had a meeting where uh, it's a very corporate client, and it's it's this kind of large series of portraits, and there's one group portrait, and they pulled this um, personal image that I did several years ago of a bunch of like really grungy guys in this like old warehouse. They were mm. supposed it's like a joke. It's supposed to be like an underground arm wrestling ring. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I saw that image. I love it. And um, I, the, I think the, I the illegal arm wrestling ring still is on my one? website. But they pulled that, and they said they really like that. And we're talking about photographing like twelve CEOs, you know, in a boardroom. And I just thought, wow, that's. I mean, it's a group of people, but and they said they wanted that kind of quirkiness. And so, um, yeah, sometimes it's funny how people can make the leap because someone else would have said, well, you know, clearly you don't shoot businessmen because this picture or whatever. And so, mm. um, but. I mean, to answer your question, yeah, I've had I've had people show me a lot of times my holiday uh, family pictures that I've been doing the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, they'll show those and say that that's really what they're responding to for some project. And um, it, I mean, sometimes it seems like more of a jump than other times, but I, it seems like people really end up responding to the work that I've created and produced on my own and the ideas that I've come up with that aren't tied to something else. So. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so let, let's talk about that for a second because um, you, you're, and again, if you're, if you have a chance, if you're at home watching this, um, be sure to jump on uh, John's site and and uh, take a peek at. Right now, we're going to talk about his his family pictures. Um, I'm thinking about the one on the side of the road with with the Sasquatch uh, or Bigfoot, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, and then this year's, I think it was this year, you guys are up in a tree and you have the yeah. beard and. Um, uh, this idea, especially with editorial photographers, it strikes me as consistently so that it's about the vision. And when 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 people hire someone like you, they what they're hiring is not just the technical execution, although that's part of it. I I, I expect, but a, a big chunk of it is you got this idea uh, to to put your your baby child in the arms of a Bigfoot and, and to be kind of, you know, whatever, you know, kind of given this nonchalant look back and your wife's so cute and, um, and that that people can go, Oh my gosh, if he can create that, what else could he create over here? Mm -hmm. And the other part that I'm struck by in it is it seems like, um, when you're photographing things that you, you like to shoot, like the, out of your own creation, that, that's if, and you get to get paid to do it in another context. It just seems like that would be the kind of work that you'd want to flourish in. That's what you want to promote and put on your site and have out there for folks. Um, what what I guess two things. One, how important is vision in your mind? And then two, how the heck do you come up with these ideas? Um, well, I mean, I guess I think vision is you know very important. Um, I think consistency is hmm. important to have in your vision as well. That's not to say you can't. When you say right. tell tell me more about consistency, what do you mean when you say that? Um, I think I think as an artist and as a brand, because you know that's we are essentially all our own brand. Yeah, it's important to be consistent and to be um, understood by your target audience. You know, for example, uh, I, I sometimes I'll use the example of like Coke. If Coke started selling under the same brand, office furniture. How yeah. comfortable would you be in their in their product? You know, right on either end. You know, the soft drink or the office furniture. I mean, it's very confusing. Like, what is this brand all of a sudden? What are they trying to do? Mm. Why are they changing? Why aren't they comfortable sticking with what they're good at? Kind of thing. And so, I think um, I think it's important to be able to show consistently that you're passionate about something and that you're committed and good at that thing. Uh, rather than being all over the board and also especially when you get into I mean I think it's true for all types of photography but especially when you get into uh, advertising mm. client wants to see and they want to know that you've done what they want to hire you for like a million times they want to know that you can do it with your eyes closed mm. and you can you can translate that into any industry I mean um, if you needed to, if you needed to get your car fixed if your car broke down you wouldn't go calling like refrigerator repair shops, you know, and being like, "Oh man, this guy's really talented. I bet he could take those talents and translate it into this other completely different thing." And it's the same thing for like weddings, for example. I mean, yep. people don't go 
trolling for, uh, you know, auto photographers to see, oh, this guy's really talented. I bet he could do a great wedding. Like, they want to know, this guy has done exactly what I want to hire. He showed consistency in that. And he can, you know, he can do a great job for us. And so um, I think that it's, that's why I say consistency, because I think it's important to show that repetition, but also being able to vary your vision and your creative, you know, ideas within that consistency. And so, Mm -hmm. and that's tricky. It's not an easy thing to do, but um, it's certainly easier to do when you decide to work in the area that you actually are passionate about, because then you're not going to really have to try that hard because it just comes naturally. Right. uh, well, it's funny as you're saying that the other word that comes to mind a ton is continuity, um, and to have continuity of a thread, but also a, an expansive vision, or like you, you that that you can get all this down as a foundation and go even further. But you're going further in a particular direction. But that strikes me as really contrasting. At least, so I'm I'm in portrait and weddings and um, a different, kind of slightly different kind of portrait, um, and I'm I'm struck by how that isn't consistent in my genre. How photographers broadcast, hey, I do the, you know kind of the weddings parties anything approach of um, I'll basically do whatever you pay me for, mm-hmm. and and I get why. I mean, I, I think that there's on some level a degree of like, look, I got to feed the kids, I got to, I have a lot of compassion for the perspective. Yeah. But if I'm hearing you right, you're saying, yeah, that that's the motivation is understandable, but it's just not very effective. Is that fair? Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm not going to tell someone that you can't do several things but you need to understand how they fit in with your brand maybe you need two different brands you know to mm. to do whatever it is that you're doing I mean it's different for everyone I'm not gonna lay down like a blanket rule but um, I think I think the other side of that too is um, for me I mean I used to do several different types of photography and I, I came to a point where I realized um, I had a desire to try to be great at something mm. and um, I knew that if I was doing several things, I would maybe be good at several things, but I would never be great at one thing. Mm. And so that's when I decided to just completely focus on what I'm doing now because um, it requires so much attention to be really great at something. It requires so much focus and so many hours that if you're not committed to doing that one thing, you'll never really achieve it. So um, there's, there's several ways you could look at that. but. I mean, I think yeah, some people could say, well, I need to do all these different things to pay the bills, and that's true maybe in the current situation, but that's not really like thinking long-term in my opinion. Yeah. If you continue with that mindset, you'll always just be getting by doing those things. Um, you know, r- running a business is, is a, it's risky, you know? I mean, hmm. um, if people are looking for something safe, they probably shouldn't be doing photography, I would say. Mm. So if you're going to take that jump, you might as well go all the way and try to really make it happen at what you want to do rather than saying, you know, like, I mean, it's like it's like deciding that you're going to buy a Porsche or some fancy car and then, you know, getting half the money saved up and then just like getting a junker that like doesn't really work and you still ended up spending more money on that mm. somewhat fancy car than if you got a brand new, like, you know, economy class card. It just doesn't make sense. Like if you're going to do it, do it. I guess that's my, mm-hmm. that's my whole, that's a, that's a bad analogy, but. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. Cause I, I guess what I'm really struck by is, cause, and I'm sure you get emails like this all the time. Photographers saying, okay, what should I do next? And at the end of this call, I'm going to say, what should you do in the first, you know, 90 days and 190 days and two years of your business if you're just starting out. But, but ultimately what I'm hearing you say is there's real tension between, look, there, this is not for the faint of heart. It's not, uh, it's never been more challenging, more competitive uh, ev- ever, and yet it's still un- remarkably accessible. Most people can get in the game easier than ever. Uh, yes. And at the same time, what you're saying is so super risky. But um, if you're gonna if you're gonna play a risky game, play the risky game. Like play right. it like yeah. play it to win it. Yeah. A- and uh, that that I think is a reflection of reality not just a prescription or advice it just is uh, the way and i suspect that there's um there's a lot of wisdom in there uh for folks who are listening in and and i i, I just feel compassion uh for for, on, for myself on days when i don't want to take the risk when it feels scary and i'm you know terrified to jump in with both feet but realizing that when i don't when i dip my toe or kind of try to ease my way in there are folks who are hungry enough uh, and willing to take a risk, who are going all in, and they're going to get the benefit for it. Right. Yeah. Um, so, 
uh, t let's talk a little bit about some of your work because you, uh, whatever you've done, you've done some fun things uh, to put yourself in a great position. A couple things that I'm struck by is um, uh, the water beards project that you did. Yeah. Uh, was that a personal project? What 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 was that? Um, I mean, it, it kind of feel it feels like personal work, but it was it was a um, a project for uh, a friend of mine owns a water bottle company who I'm actually I'll give him a little promotion right now. Um, who is it? Talk. Let's it's promote. called Mir. Okay. M I I R. Okay. Um, it's a really it's actually a really great company. It sounds like I'm giving a commercial, but um, every you, bottle they sell, they. I'm provide, asking you to. It's no commercial. Just yeah, tell me all about uh, it. Every bottle they sell, they provide clean drinking water. Um, by building clean water wells in developing countries, and and was uh, this part of the work where you were in the Philippines recently? No, this is well, it's different, but I think the reason I went maybe had something to do with the work that I did with Mir as well. Hmm. Um, but last, it was a year ago, last January, I went to um, Liberia with Mir, and I photographed um, the building of the first two clean water wells that they funded, hmm. and then that's where I also shot kind of like basically a personal series of portraits of children when I was over there. Hmm. And um, from that from that uh, trip and from kind of working with Mir and my friend Brian, um, we just, we've been talking a lot about his brand and about business and um, we, were doing a, we were doing a film shoot one day and he was uh, joking around about, um, I don't know if, if you've experienced this, but there's a lot of wide mouth water bottles in the industry. A lot of water bottles are actually, it's a simple product, but they're designed pretty poorly. Mm -hmm. um, and we were just joking around about, you know, like, like you're talking about like the Nalgene big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You'll just, sometimes you just spill all over yourself. Like yeah. the, the hole is like the size of your face. And so you're trying to, especially if you're like in a car or something, you're trying to drink and it gets all over you. So he yeah. was kind of joking around about the term water beard. And as soon as I heard him say that, I instantly had this, uh, image in my head of, you know, people with water beards, like taking it literally. And so um, I pitched it to him. I pitched the idea to him and he was really excited about it and told me to run with it. So um, I basically, it was kind of like basically self-produced um, commercial work, but then they ended up using it. So I got the benefit of having these print ads. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, a lot of my work sometimes kind of toes that line between personal work and, you know, even even if I'm collaborating with a, with a brand. Um, on some sort of campaign. Got it. Um, oh, I get it. Okay, that's cool. So M I I R. Uh, hey, folks, check it out. That's actually pretty clever. I, and I, I love I love the messaging. It's a uh, way to differentiate. I think it's really cool. Uh, the other ones that I'm struck by is, um, you know, getting access to folks like Sarah Palin or Annie Leibovitz or, um, uh, and I, I feel this is embarrassing that I don't have his name on the tip of my tongue because I always think of him as the president on 24. Oh, Haysbert, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, with Dennis uh, Haysbert. Um, those, and, and so many more. I mean, uh, Kelly Carinder, of all people. Uh, you know, people who start the Tea Party. And it's just so many. And, and Or even like uh, Seattle folks like um, uh, Mark Driscoll. Um, you know, and, and uh, the football player at UW that you're friends with, Jake Locker. Um, how how do you get access to these people when they're rolling through a market like Seattle? That just it struck struck me. Is it just your representation, or are you are you working the channels? Uh, I mean, it's it's a mix of both. It depends on the season and you know who I'm working with at the time. A lot of a lot of that work came from. Um, when I was working with Seattle Met, which is a local magazine here in Seattle, mm -hmm. for a while they had a celebrity column or piece that they did every month. And so um, through that, I was able to get a lot of access to um, celebrities for stories that they hired me to do, um, or portraits they hired me to take for the stories. Um, and then I think really, yeah, I mean, if, if you want the whole story of it, I think the first celebrity I got was through Seattle Met, and I basically just tried to leverage that. Um, and that was know, no, but that was no small one. I mean, that was uh, Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, I, yeah it? Anthony Hopkins. Um, that, I mean, no, it wasn't small. But at the same time, I think a lot of people. I I feel like a lot of people go, yeah, well, I, it was just that one, or it wasn't even that great of a picture, or whatever. And it's like, if you have that mindset, um, it's it's not going to get you anywhere. And so I basically took that picture and just kind of presented it like yeah I just did this and even if it even if it means like calling yourself a celebrity photographer I mean there might be people that go well you're not you just took one or whatever but you kinda have to own it you know you have yep. to name it and claim it so um, that was just pretty much my mindset I tried to 
leverage that on my website and just through my communication with people. And then I got another shoot and um, I just, every time I got a new project like that, I tried to maximize, you know, my, my marketing out of that. And then eventually out of the whole body as it grew. But um, yeah, a lot of it is just maintaining relationships with people who have access, who are working with these people. Mm. Um, and then eventually it gets to the point where, um, you know, it just kind of becomes known if someone wants to do a celebrity, and then it becomes not just a celebrity in Seattle, but if someone wants my particular look, even if That's they're right. outside of Seattle, then you start getting considered for that kind of stuff. And so, that was that was uh, one of the first big ones for me was the Sarah Palin shoot, um, which I think was largely based on the celebrity work I had done locally. But they, uh, the publisher, liked how I approached celebrities and how I. They were stylized, but at the same time, like they were still approachable and somewhat accessible, and um, very humanizing. I mean, that's I think that's the the irony of the quirky images that you do. My feedback is just they seem um, they they're getting off they're voluntarily getting off a pedestal, participating with with really remarkable image, and then whatever we do as fans, we can put them back on their pedestal if we want. But for some reason, for me, in in a Twitter land world. Th those images are really timely. They just seem very like I I want. I, it feels proximity just adjusts uh, with your images. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Well, well, the the other one we have to talk about is of course Anne Leibovitz because here you know this this iconic photographer of our day uh, who is in herself a celebrity but also a celebrity photographer and now you're a celebrity photographer shooting some like I'm I have a friend who who writes uh, he's also from Seattle a guy named Jeff Jensen. Uh, who writes for Entertainment Weekly magazine, and he writes comic books, and does all these cool things, and he's a big fan of horror, and he got to go out and interview um, Stephen King and J.J. Abrams, uh, and the three of them went to a, a horror movie together, and it oh, was wow. like this gorgeous moment of like you know transcendence where it all came together. Yeah. On some level, that's what this sounds like for you, was having a chance to, to interact with her and, as a professional, but also to take her picture. How, how, talk a little bit about that event. Um, yeah, I was so I was photographing John Waters, um, who he he wrote Hairspray. Yeah, and um, somebody was there, I think, doing some PR for him, and it was a really great shoot. It went really well. We had a lot of fun, and he even stuck around after and just kind of joked and chatted with us, which doesn't often happen. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow it came up that the one of the people working PR with him was also working with Annie Leibovitz on her um, upcoming book tour, which was her book uh, At Work. Yeah. And um, I just, I, this is, this similar situation has actually happened to me several times. It's amazing how it's worked, but I just kind of blurted out loud. I said, I would love to photograph her. And everyone just kind of chuckled and said, well, wouldn't that be something? And um, uh, this, the woman said, well, um, I don't think she actually was really letting anyone photograph her these days. We haven't had, we haven't had uh, sitting for her in quite some time. And um, anyway, that, that was that. And then several months later I got an email and they said do you want to photograph Annie Leibovitz um, I guess remembering me from that conversation and from the photo shoot with John and um, I said of course yeah I would love to and um, did you did you now you're a human being did you kind of freak out oh yeah absolutely I was I mean I was ecstatic but at the same time uh, I don't to be honest I don't remember this particular instance I certainly get excited and my heart jumps when these kinds of things come up but you also have to kind of like maintain a little bit because it doesn't mean that you are going to get it either like sure if I if I had if I've if I got the chance to photograph everyone I've talked to somebody about potentially photographing I mean it would be unbelievable but sure that's just kind of how it goes so I was yeah I was excited needless to say and then um, a few days later an email said that and I'm still unclear if it was Annie or just her people or who but they said that she wanted to um, needed to review my portfolio before she'd agree to it and then a couple of days later, I got an email back and said that she agreed to to work with me, and so mm. that was obviously like an incredibly exciting mm. ex opportunity. Um, I, I actually had about a month before the shoot when I found out, and so somehow I was able to just kind of put it out of my mind for a little bit, and um, I didn't start thinking about it until pretty close into the day, just because I knew sometimes with this kind of stuff, like you yeah. can overanalyze it, sure. and it doesn't matter because ultimately it's going to be there's going to be constraints, and I knew it was going to be very limited time. It was going to be very quick. Mm -hmm. um, we were going to be in a hotel um, where a lot of this, a lot of celebrity portraits happen, um, and so I just decided to work with what I had and keep it simple. But 
try to get my goal was to get one really great image at least an image that I was really excited about and mm -hmm. proud of and so that's why I decided to do a studio portrait because um, I mean I I like to kind of I like to kind of focus in on what is the point of the image what am I trying to say and so for me the hotel really had nothing to do with her I mean she was there but that was it there wasn't really any interest from the location um, so I knew if, we were going to add anything why include it that makes sense right so I just decided to focus in on her and um, that's what I did and I, I had some specific ideas for lighting and kind of posing but once she got there she was very fidgety and she was actually noticeably nervous um, hmm. and she was moving around quite a bit and um, she commented that you know she wasn't really used to being on that side of the camera and, um, and so I, I realized I wasn't gonna get her to like just hold still like I wanted in this certain way and so it kind of it very much felt like a collaboration I she was suggesting and moving around and she wanted to pull up a table to lean on and hmm. so I, I just kind of let her do what made her feel most comfortable and she started really using her hands and that's and I think at one point I have another image I haven't shown very much but she just kind of put her head in her hands like to rub her eyes and to like kind of get herself ready and hmm. and there was this one another moment where she put her hand over her face and I asked her just to hold it just quickly because it was very striking and that was the image that hmm. um, that came about that that most people think of about that shoot but yeah it was it was incredible it was like the only time I've ever been very much aware of who I was looking at through my camera usually it becomes lights and color and shapes and feeling of emotion but I was I was aware and continue in thinking to myself wow this is Annie Leibovitz you know that I'm looking at through the camera so that, you know I, I will no matter who I photograph the rest of my life I'll probably always I know I'll always look back and still feel some excitement and mm. good memories about that shoot well no doubt I mean it, it, it's funny when you think of her career and how you know she it, it's funny it's not um, I don't want to be overly nostalgic or even make things up I just have tracked her career a little bit and what strikes me is the way she emerged was she just immersed herself. She threw herself into every situation she could. She embeds herself with the Rolling Stones. She gets to, you know, she happens to be with John Lennon and Yoko Ono the day that the tragedy right. happens. And but she, she, she too was very fortuitous and kind of arriving in a moment. And it sounds like that's a lot of what your own career is. And then to create an image that iconically looks like an iris, like closing on an eye of her. I mean, it's just it's brilliant. I, I, I'm sure she is thrilled um, with what you created and. Um, but it seems like in all these things, John, what I'm most struck with is that you consistently have a long view to what you're doing, whether it be um, your not-for-profit work or the things you're supporting or the way you're positioning your brand or the people you're choosing and how you're setting those things up. If I'm at home and I'm watching this and I'm, I'm really interested in going, look, I, I do want to go all in in this high-risk venture called photography and my genre of choice. And they want, they're sitting down with coffee with you and – and you know what you know, but you don't have your brand or the platform that you're standing on right now. Uh, and you're starting from scratch in this era uh, where it's it's not the 60s when, when Annie was starting. It's not uh, it's not even like 2007 when you know or 8 when Twitter was just coming out. Like Twitter's a stat. It's just a different world now. Mm -hmm. How would you go about uh, like initial steps? What, we, what would you be spending your time on in trying to launch a brand now? That's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, I think we tend to overcomplicate this industry and what needs to be done. Um, hmm. But I think, I think at the core of what it takes to make it, it's important to be shooting a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, people. I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, but it's it's important to be creating work. I mean, that's that's what we do, right? We're photographers, so you need to be creating work. And then, secondly, I think marketing is the I mean, I, I wouldn't even put one as more important than the other. I mean, I think creating and marketing are hand in hand so important. Mm. Um, you could create, you know, the best work in the world, but if nobody knows about it, mm -hmm. it doesn't do you much good, really, unless you're just a hobbyist, and not just, but unless you're a hobbyist, and that's your end goal. But yeah, I mean, assuming you want, assuming you want to get your work in front of people and you want people to hire you, yeah, uh, you've got to have work to show and you've got to show it. So, I think that's that's the most important thing it's easy to get caught up in I mean every, everyone's got you know like 10 best ways to, to do this 10 best ways for social media and all that stuff and I think all of those tools and all those things are really great but I think if you're creating good work 
and and I and I use the distinction because not not to sound elitist, but I mean there is really great work, and then there's work that's just kind of like mediocre. Yeah. And if you're creating really great work, and if you're showing it to the right people, and you're being consistent, you're going to be really successful. Mm. Um, and you have to have a long-term view. You can't you can't do this really great project and expect like something to happen from it right away. Like sometimes you need to get in front of people five times over the course of three or four years or something mm-hmm. until it really sticks, until they recognize that consistency, until they remember your brand, who you are. Mm. Um, and so I think really like when a lot of times when people are asking like, what do I do? How do I do it? It's like, we're looking for shortcuts and I, and I do it. I do it too, you know, sure. but there, there really are no shortcuts. I mean, it just takes hard work. It takes, creating good work and it takes consistency over and over and over um, again yeah. one, one example I, I think about often is I remember I won't say the website but I remember reading on a pretty popular website once that postcards were dead or at least they should be um, you know don't send postcards anymore nobody likes getting postcards they largely go straight to the trash nobody sees them right um, and that was really discouraging for me especially because I was very very young and that was like, oh my, what do I, what else do I do? You know, like that's right. one of the main things. And so, um, but I, I had a, I also probably because I just spent a little bit of money on a postcard and I was like, this is not what I want to read when I just put this money in. But it was, it was something that I was really proud of. I felt like it was really good. I had a designer put it together and I, I went out and did meetings like the following month and I, I think I had about 10 meetings and six of the people I met with had my postcard on their wall. No kidding. And People put up maybe like 15 postcards at the most, it seems like, on the wall. And because, you know, space is limited. And so that that really made an impact on me. It made me realize, okay, people hate getting bad postcards. People hate <laughs> getting postcards that are That's inappropriate for what they're doing. You know, like people don't want to get a bunch of food photography if they're working at, you know, Esquire or whatever. I mean, um, so... Yeah, there's a lot of problems with like certain with email, e promos, and postcards or whatever. But the problems largely are coming from people who are being unthoughtful and putting out bad work, essentially. And so mm. I would say, don't be discouraged by all this noise and things that people tell you you can or can't do. Mm. You just have to you have to be sure of yourself, and you have to be confident. And if you're doing good work, and if you just know, okay, it's gonna it's gonna be a grind. I'm, I'm gonna have to get after it. Mm. That's that's really the best path to take, and so ultimately, again, if you look back at that, it's not it's nothing groundbreaking. I mean, mm-hmm. this is pretty simple advice, um, but I think so often we just want shortcuts, and really, I think there are no shortcuts. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, you hear about a photographer that just kind of gets thrown right into it, and some great things happen, and that's mm-hmm. not to say it can't happen, but. Um, you know, I've known some photographers who have just been like the flavor of the month who have been really great and yeah. hopefully they recognize that and they knew this isn't going to continue. I have to really make sure that I keep up a, a good campaign that will get me through, you know, to the next wave. And so and that's a really great way to think about it. Even even if you do find yourself busier than ever and it's like your best year ever, you better not rest and assume that the next year is going to be like that because if you don't keep after it and maintain that strong branding and marketing, you know, you'll find yourself Eroding. Yeah, eroding. So, I don't know. I, I'm probably rambling at this point. Not at all. Honestly, you're talking to a guy who wrote a book called Fast Track Photographer, yeah. which is like the worst title in the history of books. And um, there, and it's unfortunate because what I, what I, I, I just said this to another friend on a call like this, that I wish I had called it Efficient Track Photographer uh, or something like that, where it's not about quicker or shortcuts. It's actually the long view. But um, but it could be the most efficient. And what I'm hearing you say, honestly, it's very encouraging. It's a sense of like, yeah, there's no um, people people overestimate what they can do in one year and they underestimate what they can do in two. This kind of like drip, 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 do it again, do it again, do it again, create, create, create. And it's very compelling. It's inspiring for me uh, just as a colleague. And and uh, I, I love what you said about. It's not about the mailer. It's about whether the mailer is any good. And right. uh, I think that that's that's encouraging for anyone who's listening because then whatever the medium they choose, the mandate is excellence. Uh, and yeah. if they get excellent in almost any context, they could probably they could probably find some success. Yeah. So. so I think it's you know when when people throw out these like statements about like this works in photography or you have to do this. I mean it's important to identify okay well what are the what are the rules or what are the you know 
the factors that we're basing this statement on because so many times it's like you'll read an article from someone and maybe that article comes from their frustration of yeah people really do receive you know a hundred promos a day that's true I'm not disputing that yeah but if there's something really good if there's something thoughtful they are gonna keep it they, you know and again not everyone but um, you have to you have to show your work and so if we listen to every single article out there, we wouldn't be sending mailers, we wouldn't be sending emails, and we wouldn't be calling people asking for meetings anymore. And so mm -hmm. uh, you have to kind of just fight through that and decide you're going to do better than everyone else. You know? Awesome. Hey, John, thank you so much for, for being on the show. And, and uh, I'm, I'm going to bug you again. I, I, okay. I want you back, man. And, and also, you know, because we have common friends, you guys don't know this on, off the air, but I went to a, a college here in Southern California, and I had a particular professor who then moved on to Seattle Pacific, which is where John went to college, and uh, we have that in common, and at the very least, you and I and Ken need to go grab a bite to eat next time I'm in Seattle or something. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a small world. I'd love to, I'd love to see both of you. So. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks again, and, but if you're at home and you're watching this, a couple things. Number one, follow John Keatley. It's K-E-A-T-L-E-Y, uh, at John Keatley on, on the Twitter. Uh, thanks to Adorama for uh, underwriting this thing and for providing this opportunity. And check out all the, the past episodes uh, over at blog.fasttrackphotographer.com. So thanks again, John. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.